and welcome to this episode of How to Be a Great GM. Well, we've got our new background installed and I'm very excited. It's a sci-fi-esque theme. Let me get out the way so you can have a look, see what you think. Designed by, uh, well, yours truly. <laughs> but we thought we'd change things up a little bit and, well, with the support of our Patreons, it's something that we can do. So thank you very much to all of our wonderful Patreons. Now, reason... Blah, 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 blah. <coughs> right, my apologies. In response to this new fandangle technology known as Twitter, I think, people responded to a tweet that I tweeted <laughs> this morning. As a matter of fact, I sent out a tweet asking the followers uh, of uh, How to GM or at How to GM which is uh, our tweet channel. You can find it on the website and all that sort of thing. Asking them what they would prefer, a video on the Starfinder or a video on how to create cool encounters. Well, the response was overwhelming in the favor of how to create cool encounters. And so that is exactly what we're going to be looking at today. Now, cool encounters is open to interpretation. What makes an encounter cool to begin with? What makes an encounter not cool to begin with? Statistics and values and numbers, in my opinion, don't make an encounter cool. It's how the encounter unfolds and the memories that the players have when they leave it that that's the most important thing. And that was, is what will make an encounter cool, in my opinion. So, provided that we can leave the players with something to think about, to talk about on their way home after the game session, then we have created a cool encounter. So, if you think back to encounters that stick out in your mind, encounters that really got your juices flowing, whether you were a player or a GM. Most of those will probably be when you rolled cool dice numbers like a natural 20 to behead that dragon or of the actual circumstances itself. So to unpack how do we make those circumstances work, the most important thing that we need to remember is that we need to balance cool encounters with everyday kind of encounters. In other words, not every encounter should be cool. Now, the reason for saying that is that we need some kind of level of comparison. This was a entertaining combat. This was a cool combat. So, the first thing is, in order to make a combat cool, you need to establish a benchmark for what is perhaps not so cool or mundane. Now, these are the random encounters and other encounters that your players will have as they are moving through your game world. They needn't last for many rounds. They are simply there to challenge the players a little bit, to challenge their PCs anyway, and to drive the story forward because the encounter was part of the adventure. But every now and again you need to have a cool encounter. And for that we need to give it a little bit more thought than just working out what the challenge rating, what the experience level, what the DC, what the da -da -da, all those wonderful mathematical models that are supposed to help you generate cool encounters. We need to look at what is going to differentiate your cool encounter from those kind of encounters. I start with geography. Geography is so important because geography enca encapsulates not just the terrain, it's about the setting itself. Imagine a combat between, let's say, two lightsaber-wielding Jedi and a Sith Lord and they're busy fighting. Well, we just need to look at the films in order to unpack cool encounters versus uncool encounters. What made the battle between Luke Skywalker and Darth Vader on the Bespin a cool encounter? Well, there wasn't very much action going on. They kind of bashed at each other for a little bit and then Luke fell down and then they ran around a little bit. There were many, 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 many reasons for that. But what made it cool was the space in which they were operating. George Lucas then had to outdo himself, so then he set the battle between Qui-Gon Jinn, Obi-Wan Kenobi and Darth Maul in this weird energy barrier thing where it separated the characters from the enemy and they had to wait and it gave them an opportunity to psych one another out. Then he had to take it even further and put once again poor old Obi-Wan Kenobi on a lava pit river thing battling it out whilst floating around on robots that were levitating over the lava until eventually one of them came to a rather dismal end. Every single time he was trying to ramp up the location, the geography in which the combat was happening to make it cool. Now you don't have to have rivers of lava for your characters to fight over. 
But just varying the spaces in which they're fighting, maybe they're fighting on horseback while it's full speed. Maybe they're on board a train. Maybe they're on board a starship that's rotating through a giant gaseous nebula that phases in and out of temporal existence. And occasionally, if you step in the wrong direction, poof, suddenly you're in a different dimension. And then you poof, suddenly back again, which causes combat to be interesting. So geography is one of the easiest ways to make your combats cool, to make them exciting, and to make them different. If they're in an inn, how can you make the geography of an inn that much more interesting? Well, what if the inn is a two-story affair with a balcony that looks around the lower ground, it looks above it, and um, they're fighting across that. Or perhaps it's an inn where the floor is slowly collapsing inwards because there's a giant sinkhole underneath. Maybe it's an inn that's on fire. Maybe it's an inn that, as the combat starts, takes off and flies through the air because it's been lifted up by a tornado. Maybe it's an inn that happens to be on a space station which is currently being sucked into a black hole and certain small parts of it are slowly being pulled away as the characters have to fight along a corridor. You can always, always think of an interesting place to set your combat. On the other hand, one must juxtapose. It is through the juxtaposition of different types of things that we get our ability to say that that is cool and that is not, if we have something to compare against. So you could also just set it in a mundane setting, which then means you need to play with something else to make it cool. So you could play with the weather. Now, if you're out in space, you go, well, the weather's fairly mundane. Ah, 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 ah. A meteor shower that suddenly comes past, a neutrino burst from a white dwarf that suddenly collapses on itself to become a brown dwarf. All those kind of things can happen out in the deepest, darkest falls of space, and they don't often get taken advantage of. Isn't that just changing the geography of the scene? Well, yes it is to a degree. So, the weather inside a starship, what happens if they walk into the terrarium or the uh, uh, biology lab and the plants are going mad and the whole place is humid and slick with droplets of water everywhere? Now it's a slip and slide. Again, is that weather or is that geography? Well, does it make a difference? It's still a much cooler situation than just having them fight in a corridor. Obviously on a planet's surface, it's a lot easier for you to have weird and wonderful weather. Lightning strikes, bouncing around next to the characters, quick sand, lava if you must. All kinds of weather now can present themselves. Maybe there's a volcano erupting somewhere in the distance and it's causing earth tremors. Maybe it's sleet. Maybe it's sand so thick that the characters are all effectively blind fighting. You can come up with many different ways in which weather starts to make the combat that much more interesting. Now, how do we use weather and geography when we combine them together? How do we use them in terms of making sure the combat's interesting? Guaranteed, whatever system you're using, there will be some kind of dice influence that then happens. What you must make absolutely sure of is that whatever affects the players must affect the monsters equally so because otherwise the players will feel as if you are just stacking the odds against them. If it's total pitch darkness, but the creatures can see in pitch darkness, well, bully for them for being able to attack when they have the greatest advantage. However, the players need to have some way of overcoming that, or at least some way of mitigating that fact, otherwise they're going to get cut to pieces. Alternatively, if it's sand blasting across the um, terrain and they can barely see anything, have monsters randomly hit each other, even if the dice say that they wouldn't. Have it happen anyway. That makes it cool. You stand up in front of you, the sand warrior stands, and suddenly his companion slashes at him because he mistakes his silhouette for one of your own. Those kind of things make combat cool. Numbers can make combat cool. And this was one of the few things that Dungeons & Dragons 4th Ed brought into the system which I liked. And it was numbers of mass minions that literally would take one hit and fall over dead. All the characters needed to do was hit them once and they would die. No resistance, none of that kind of nonsense. They were just there to bulk out combat. And yes, in mass they could do all sorts of wonderful things in terms of overpowering characters, etc, etc, etc. 
So numbers, whether it's one gigantic creature or whether it's a hundred diminutive, diminutive creatures running around, it's about playing with those and seeing which ones get the party going. Is it two enemies per PC? Is it one enemy per C PC? Is it one enemy for the entire group? In which case that enemy needs to be particularly dangerous, particularly terrifying. And that's what brings us to the next point. And this is what made a lot of the combats in, let's say, oh, I don't know, the game Mortal Kombat, for example, interesting. The characters that they're fighting themselves, the monsters that they're fighting themselves, have stereotypical monsters, have a troll that regenerates unless it's burnt by fire, have the bloodthirsty Klingon attack, have the Dalek just charge after the PCs, have those, but then punctuate them every now and again with someone or something that stands out from the rest. The albino orc, the one that doesn't seem to fight like all the others, the Romulan who is singing whilst in battle. If you can have a unique twist on the character or on the monster, that will certainly make the encounter feel cool, especially if that one has different abilities to what the players are expecting. If you set up that you're fighting crocodiles because you're in the Amazon jungle and suddenly one of them is twice the size of the others and makes a bellowing sound and uses its tail and its teeth as well as perhaps spines on its back, that starts to change things up. That puts the PCs on a step up, a step backwards as a matter of fact, as they now try and figure out what to do with this new type of monster, this new enemy. And that makes it cool. So change it up a little bit. There's a video that I did recently on powerful NPCs. Darth Vader is a powerful NPC. So whenever, whenever there is an encounter, Vader does not launch into it with a savage attack. He starts slowly and allows his presence to terrify. So sometimes when you're dealing with the NPC, it's about them letting the PCs attack first, trivializing their attacks. The attitude of the monster or the NPC that they are fighting is just as important as how that NPC is fighting, whether they have spines or claws or magic. Mixing monsters together, so sometimes you have goblins and orcs, sometimes it's kobolds and lizardmen, sometimes it's lizardmen and giants. Mixing them up can make for a cool encounter. What makes for a more interesting encounter is discovering why those parties, those groups are mixed. Maybe it's a simple alliance. Maybe, however, they're all responding to the same thing. So sometimes you can make an encounter interesting, not by the encounter itself, but by what it leads to. Oh, remember that fight where we were busy fighting against that alien species and we found out that they were actually a mixed bag and we discovered that they were all bounty hunters trying to chase us down because there'd been a bounty put on our head from that event that we had before. So sometimes by mixing up the monsters, you need to ask why are they mixed up? What has brought them together? Are they all serving the same master? Are they all after the same goal? So that's something that's interesting. And that leads us to the next point. The goal. What is the goal of the creatures fighting? What are the goal of the creature in the encounter with the party that makes for an interesting option? Is their goal to kill the party? Is their goal just to steal something specific from a specific party member? And the moment they have it, they're in full retreat. Is their goal to slow the party down? Is their goal to impress upon the party the strength that they possess, but not to kill the party? That's an absolutely viable option. Don't come any closer. Look at how strong we are. We can defeat you without breaking uh, skin. We will not bleed in front of you. Just don't press us because we are giving you our full show of strength. So the goal of the NPCs can help drive a cool encounter. If the goal is not just kill them all, that starts to make it slightly different. And it's very important to have goals for your monsters in case the PCs take them prisoner and they interrogate them. Then they can find out all kinds of things as to what was their intention in the first place, which can lead you on a wonderful story arc and a quest to go and find the monster's master or the reason why the monsters were attacking in the first place. Another thing that you can do, and this is the final thought in terms of how to keep your game, your encounter cool, is time Time pressure is very, very useful as a tool. Perhaps they're fighting in a dimensional rift. 
in which case the PC gets an attack and then he gets another attack before the NPC reacts because he's in a different time frame. That's one way of playing with time. Another way, of course, is that the volcano is erupting and lava is busy flowing down the hill towards them, but the NPCs are keeping the PCs on the path of the lava because if they're going to die, so are the, are the PCs. The ship that they're fighting on is busy capsizing and rolling as the waves slowly push it over, forcing the PCs to run up the side of the deck to have combats whilst the ship is busy rolling and then to try and get out of the way once the ship has rolled over. Perhaps the PCs are fighting underwater, in which case their water breathing spell is running out or they are just running out of oxygen. It, it's entirely up to you. Maybe as they're busy fighting, the sandstorm that's busy blasting around them is slowly disintegrating their armor by sheer fact of it being sandpaper-like in its nature. Maybe they're freezing to death in snow, or perhaps the inn itself is collapsing under the weight of a black star, uh, uh, black star, I was going to say black star, death star, black hole. There are all kinds of reasons why you can insert time as a pressure modifier to make the combat cool. And of course, when you're inserting time, you've got to make sure that the players feel that by putting constant pressure on them for their attack rolls, rolling the monsters as quick as you can and moving the combat forward. Alternatively, maybe it's in a slow space. Maybe the PCs are attacking away at the treants that they're busy trying to kill and the treants are attacking every second round, but when they hit, they hit hard. So don't necessarily think that everything has to happen at the same regular beat of initiative order or of your turn, your turn, your turn, your turn. Sometimes things can skip a little bit to create more tension and to create a cooler encounter. So you can bring all of these elements together if you really want to. You can have a really cool NPC fighting in a weird geography with some strange weather going on whilst all of it is having to happen within the space of a few seconds before the starship jumps away and is lost forever. You can bring it all together to create interesting encounters. And none of it has been involving the dice in terms of numbers whatsoever. That is something that you can look into in terms of building interesting mathematical combats where the players have to do X, Y, and Z. And there are plenty of other channels out there that will show you how to do that. So I hope that this video was helpful in some small way or maybe sparked some idea as to how to make your next encounter just that much, in much more interesting than I'm sure it already is. If it has, hit that like button. If you want to see more, hit that subscribe button. If you want to participate with us on Twitter where we've had some interesting conversations already, you can find us at, at HowToGM. Um, I think that's what it is. Otherwise, you can find it on the website www.greatgamemaster.com. Until next time, I wish you and yours the happiest of gaming.